You are listening to the Tractor Time Podcast. We are proud to be sponsored by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are real farming equipment for real farmers and homesteaders. BCS is often mistaken for just a rototiller, but with gear-driven transmissions and dozens of professional quality implements, they truly make superior pieces of farming equipment. Engineered and built in Italy, where small farms are a way of life, BCS two-wheel tractors are built to standards of quality and durability expected of real agricultural equipment, the kind of dependability every farm needs. With PTO-driven attachments like rototillers, flail mowers, rotary plows, power harrows, chippers, shredders, snow throwers, even a utility trailer and a high-pressure irrigation pump, BCS America can supply tools you need to get jobs done across the farm and the homestead. Even on large farms where a four-wheel tractor is a necessity, BCS two-wheel tractors can tackle jobs that simply can't be done with the larger machines, from mowing steep slopes and along pond banks to working soil and high tunnels and hoop houses. Check out bcsamerica.com to see the full lineup of tractors and attachments and watch videos of BCS in action. We are in a revolution, but it is a revolution in which the side that fires the first shot loses. We will not fire any shots because our weapon is uncommon with sense. Hello, this is your host, Ben Trollinger. I'm editor of Acres USA Magazine and EcoFarmingDaily.com. I'm really excited to introduce you to this episode's guest. If you're a reader of Acres Magazine, you might recognize his name. Paul Dorrance writes for us frequently, and he does it with a teacher's spirit and a sense of humor. Acres Magazine is unique in that we rely not on career journalists, but on people like Paul, people who are in the field doing the hard, challenging work of farming. Paul is also one of the featured speakers of our EcoAg conference in December. EcoAg is kind of like Coachella or Woodstock, if you prefer older references. Instead of music, we bring together a group of some of the biggest names in regenerative agriculture. I'm just looking at a list, and it's incredible. Kerry Gillum, Zach Bush, Kathleen Merrigan, and here's some other names you might recognize. Neil Kinsey, Mark Shepard, Bob Quinn, David Montgomery, Andre Liu, Paul Detloff, Gary Zimmer. The list goes on. Paul Dorrance is in that mix, and I'm thrilled to introduce him to you today. He's a former Air Force pilot. He wears a big 10-gallon hat, and he's as humble as they come. In this episode, we're going to learn a little bit about Paul and his farm, but also about his latest article for a magazine. In that piece, Paul writes about his misadventures in livestock guardian animals. You're going to want to hear it. Without further ado, here's Paul Dorrance. Paul, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. First off, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your operation and the principles that guide it. Absolutely. Uh, so I own and operate a uh, pastured Providence Farmstead, which is a uh, pasture-based livestock operation in Chillicothe, Ohio. Uh, I have 111 acres here, and uh, on that 111, uh, raise grass-fed beef, grass-fed lamb, uh, pastured non-GMO pork, uh, poultry, uh, as well as eggs. And all of my products, uh, most of my products, are direct sale to consumer, whether it's off the farm, uh, farmer's markets. I do have a couple of uh, really good wholesale customers to include a restaurant in Chillicothe that says uh, I'm the sole provider of their ground beef. Uh, but again, most of my products are direct sales to consumer. Um, and, and that really comes back to what this farm is all about, which is providing good, clean, healthy food for others um, in the community. And tell us a little bit about your background in food production. How long have you been doing this? Is this did you grow up doing this? It seems like you've taken sort of an interesting path to get here. <laughs> interesting is one word for my path, yes. I, uh, uh, I was not a farmer uh, by trade. Uh, I certainly am, am new, relatively new to this, uh, to this world. But um, uh, I grew up country uh, in upstate New York. My parents were had a little homestead, um, so I grew up around animals. I grew up comfortable uh, and, and somewhat uh, self-sufficient in, in a sense, uh, but certainly nothing like what I'm doing now. Um, uh, my path after uh, high school, I, I went to college and uh, went through uh, reserve officer training uh, and ended up at the end of my college years uh, commissioning into the Air Force as a second lieutenant, and I started uh, my, my career as an Air Force pilot. So for, uh, for 12 years, I was my, my main and only career was to fly 
uh, military airplanes for a living. Uh, along the way, um, the food became really critically important to me uh, and, and to my family. And, uh, and so we made a wholesale change in lifestyle that resulted in me walking away from active duty service, um, becoming uh, an Air Force reservist here in Ohio, and starting the farm from scratch about six years ago. What was that inflection point for you that changed your path? So my, my son, Caleb, is, is 10 now, um, uh, but, uh, and he's now joined by his two sisters uh, who are eight and five. But it was his uh, <laughs> impending birth that, that really changed a lot about how, um, uh, how I thought about uh, really all sorts of different things, including food. So uh, we began to question uh, why all of a sudden um, my wife had to microwave her lunch meats or why all of a sudden we were choosing organic uh, because of the, uh, of the baby that was growing inside of her. And it made me question uh, food and, and wonder, well, if, it was, if it's not safe for the baby growing, then is it really safe for me? Is it okay for us uh, as a family? And so uh, we began to do some research and do some, um, uh, some, some self-guided um, uh, information gathering. And as a result of that, we changed uh, an awful lot about our lifestyle and the way that we looked at things. Uh, but food was first and foremost in that list. Um, there's no question that uh, I went from making fun of organic uh, food, for example, to seeking it out. I went from uh, shopping at uh, the Piggly Wiggly in Charleston, South Carolina, to uh, to driving an hour one way to my farmer uh, who, who raised good, healthy meat uh, for me. And so I'd take coolers and, and buy a, a month's worth of meat uh, for, for us. And so it, it really did change uh, the overall outlook for food um, uh, in, in my mind. And so at the end, when it became very clear to me that the Air Force and I were, you know, thank you very much, but uh, it's been great, but it's time to do our own thing. Starting and raising food for others the way that I now wanted to eat myself uh, was, the, was the main uh, push and focus behind starting this farm. Yeah, I mean, buying organic, shopping in a farmer's market, supporting local farmers, that's one thing. Doing it yourself going into farming yourself is a whole different ball of wax what challenges did you have when you were first going down that particular road and what books were for what books for example were influential in um in getting you to where you wanted to go right yeah it was it was a very big deal and, and i did do a lot of research as much as possible both um i found a lot of value in reading other people's stories. So I, I actually had um, a list of, of folks blogs that were that were kind of just a few years ahead of me um, that that I read and kind of did some lessons learned and, and figured out some things from from their experiences. Um, I also uh, I did an awful lot of reading everything from, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of specific books, grass fed cattle is one small scale livestock farming. Um, uh, the Salatin series, uh, uh, at all that, you know, you can farm, um, those were very influential to me. Um, I read um, uh, some, maybe some less, less instructional type of stuff, but still very much informative things like Gene Longston and, uh, and Wendell Berry, uh, uh, Michael Pollan, those kinds of folks uh, absolutely sort of spoke into my overall approach and decision making. But I, I reached a point where I mean, you can only do so much reading. You, at some point, you've got to go for it. And for me, you know, if you've got a little piece of land that you can try some things on, you know, that's great. But I didn't. I was, I was living on an Air Force base. I didn't have a property. So for me to take that next step, short of maybe an internship or apprenticeship type of program, uh, required me to do it all and, and jump in uh, both feet and uh, and everything all at once. And that's, that's the approach I took. I don't recommend it for everybody, but that's what worked for me. And all told, how many years have you been a full-time farmer? Uh, I, uh, I, I bought this place and moved in August of 2013. So we are closing in on, or just closed out six years. So I'm on my seventh year um, as a full-time farmer. I do have the reserve gig that helps me with health insurance and the occasional 
um, uh, you know, bit of money in the in the winter time, especially. But uh, yes, full time farming now in my seventh year. So when you first started, you had sort of a base of knowledge that was based in in large part on reading that you had done and yes. research that you had done. What were the biggest surprises that you had when you were first really making a go of it? Yeah, <laughs> that list is long and distinguished. But uh, I can the, the first thing that came to my mind was, uh, and, and this is advice that I give to others that I'm that I'm blessed to be able to speak into and mentor now, uh, is for me I found, you know I can I could plan everything to a T, and I'm a planner by nature, so I'm 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 no slouch at it. But it just seemed like everything on the farm took twice as long and cost twice as much as I thought it would. So I had you know when I was making really good money flying airplanes for a living, I saved and saved and saved. And I had this nest egg that was its purpose was to get me through the, the first few years of, of mistakes and inefficiencies and get, you know, building my market and all those kinds of things. And it, it did do that. But boy, I was close because of that idea that it just, and it was almost <laughs> to the penny. It seemed that everything cost twice as much and took twice as long as I thought I could get it done. Um, then the other piece, there's just so little information out there for this kind of farming. Uh, you can find uh, just tons and tons of data on raising animals in a feedlot. Uh, and, and because there's lots of people doing it, and we have that system in America, we have that system perfected pretty much. But there's just very little information out there for what I wanted to do. Then I got myself into a couple of pinches by using bad information in order to make my decision. One specific example was I, I had, I bought cows and I, they were bred and then I bought uh, wean steers from another farmer so that I would have beef. Uh, and about, um, you know, the second year of business, I had all five spoken for deposits taken, sold on the hoof, ready to go to a custom cut um, type of scenario. And I got to looking at these animals and I'm like, there's no way they're just not ready. And I went, dug in, you know, and actually ended up asking somebody uh, at an agricultural conference. And I said, hey, you know, what's the deal here? And they said, well, how old are they? And I said, well, they're about a, about a year, but everything I've read says about 18 months. And the poor guy almost stroked out on me. He said, dude, you can't, that's not, you can't do that on grass. That's, that's, a, that's a grain number. 18 months is grain. You need to add a year to that. And my heart just sunk. And I had to go back to every single one of those customers and say, you know, that amazing grass-fed beef you thought you were going to get just kidding it's going to be ready it's going to be ready a year from now not not in the months upcoming uh and that was just a you know a foolish feeling uh of course but all of that stemmed ultimately from information that i thought i had and then it turns out it wasn't um didn't apply to, to my type of farming so i had to wait an entire another year to finally get those animals sold and go back to customers with my tail tucked between my legs because I had messed up and promised them something that I wasn't able to deliver. What was the customer response? Um, as I remember it, it was about 50-50. I think there were a couple that were pretty ticked off. Uh, and of course, all their money went back to them. I, you know, it didn't, uh, my fault completely. Uh, but I think most were, were fairly uh, amenable. Uh, and I, I, part of that was because I was able to give them enough heads up to where they could go find something else and it wasn't like the day before uh, type of scenario, but still there were, there was a couple of uh, gruff responses along with the, um, with the, with the kind natured ones. You know, I think people in a whole array of different jobs, particularly new ones uh, often have a feeling of, you know, I think they call it imposter syndrome. Um, the learning curve in, in farming and ranching is so steep at what point did you really start to feel like, okay, this is, this is what I am. This is what I do. I feel confident. Um, because as, as our readers should know, is you also write for our magazine, Acres USA. And what I love about your writing is it's so vulnerable and honest. You're, you're very forthcoming about your own mistakes that you've made in the past. And I think that's a really effective way to sort of relay information to, to readers is to sort of show them that you're an open book and that you are not perfect, you don't claim to be, but you have some wisdom to impart. At what point did you start feeling comfortable imparting wisdom to other people who were doing what you, or who, or who maybe want to do what you're doing? Yeah. So it, 
you mentioned that the learning curve is, is steep, and that's true in all types of agriculture. Um, I do think, for me personally, I, I feel like there's a little bit of a higher calling, and I'm not trying to step on the vegetable folks' toes here, but um, when you mess up, it affects your bottom line. It affects, but uh, for everybody. But for me, I take a really serious approach to the fact that I have uh, a sentiment being essentially res that I'm responsible for. Uh, and so when I mess up and I did mess up a lot early on, animals died and that's a big deal. Uh, and I, and I don't ever want to get to the point where I'm used to that idea. Uh, I, you know, obviously they're all raised for meat, but it, when I mess up my errors sometimes directly resulted in animals, um, being essentially in some cases being traded inhumanely unfortunately and then those are lessons that I draw on now to try and avoid that from you know from happening again so it's just a really big deal to me to be responsible for uh you know the old the old school words that people use husbandry uh you know in, invokes this idea of of caretaking and and uh, uh being ultimately responsible for um an animal's well-being um uh, uh, that it just that's a high high calling so uh, uh, this is a really long answer to your question but so I would say approximately three years ago um, it would be the, the part where I said you know what I don't know it all uh, and I still don't uh, know it all but I know enough to help somebody avoid the pitfalls that I have have fallen into um, I have enough uh, behind me to help those who what what's behind me is still in front of them so I, I took a different approach. I mean, I don't have a PhD in this yet, but I do have valuable lessons learned that folks, you know, you, they don't necessarily need the PhD yet. They just need somebody who's been where they are a few years ago. Uh, and so I, I felt very comfortable stepping into that role uh, um, after building my <laughs> farmer street cred uh, in, in that sense. But really I was talking to myself because I, you know, I didn't want to have that imposter syndrome. I, I definitely know that feeling, but I, um, I was comfortable speaking into other folks uh, who, were, who were just sort of behind me a little bit, uh, not with this amazing wisdom per se, but with, hey, dude, watch out for this. Hey, girl, that, you know, when, when I did this, this is what happened, and here's what I did to get out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and just help people. Now. I mean, they're going to find their own hole that I didn't even, uh, you know, didn't stumble into. So I'm certainly no, um, no guru, but I'm grateful for the opportunity and continue to seek out the opportunity to speak into other folks uh, and encourage them that this kind of livestock and, and this kind of uh, operation is not just doable, but it's important and it's valuable uh, and it's critical to the future of, of, uh, ecological farming. Um, so that's a, that's a very important piece to me specifically, and I'm grateful for the opportunities I've been given to do that. Well, I'd love to pick up right there. You're, you're talking about ecological farming. Um, you mentioned raising livestock as a higher calling. And lately, I think there's been a lot of discussion, debate, argument, mudslinging, revolving around meat production. And sure, when you look at giant feedlots, when you look at factory farming methods and some of the environmental destruction that that does, um, it's mm -hmm. really easy to say, yes, livestock meat production is destructive um, to the environment. And so you've had this sort of backlash to that where people are saying, let's all go plant-based, um, let's ditch meat or eat a lot less of it. Um, it seems that the conversation has become very narrow in that sense, and there isn't a lot of space in the debate for ranchers and farmers like yourself who are doing things in a, com in a completely different way than the way most meat is being manufactured. I w I'd like you right. to talk a little bit about that debate and how ecological farming fits in. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, on one hand, you almost can't blame folks, especially with so much mis misinformation out there in, in agriculture in general. Um, and, and livestock farming has no uh, small piece of that uh, problem as well. But I, I really think that, the, that folks like me suffer from sort of this one size fits all 
problem and one size fits all solution where folks see something they don't like and it might be truly awful. Um, if you know, folks take a look at a feedlot and say, boy, I want no part of that. But nobody, nobody's looking at it, not nobody, but most folks aren't looking at it as there are other options. I can still eat meat raised well. And I can't tell you how many conversations I have with customers right here in the local area who, who make a switch back to meat because they finally realize they have somebody who's raising it in a manner in which they can be on board with. Uh, and I don't, I don't hold it against those folks for abstaining from meat if they felt like they couldn't get it in the way that was you know, from, from folks that were raising it well. That's, that's fine. But uh, I think the first step in the challenge is to recognize that there is a difference in production methods, that, you, that people, consumers, can find good, clean products raised in a humane manner, um, and, and that, that, that good livestock operations exist and uh, not only exist but are growing hand over foot in America. And, and so it's a little more work. It's a little more research. Yes, you've got to ask hard questions or really even learn to ask what questions uh, or, excuse me, learn what questions to ask. But nonetheless, that effort is worth it. Um, and so I'm sort of challenging the consumers in general, uh, which typically aren't the acres folks. I mean, they, the acres people get it. Um, but um, part of my job is to challenge the average consumer that, you know, listen, it's going to take a little more work, but, but good meat exists and is out there and is worth making the effort for. And I imagine humanely raised meat is a big selling point, but something you don't hear maybe as often is the role that animals can play, particularly large ruminants can play in creating ecologically healthy environments. Um, yes, absolutely. Bu that, that build soil health and create biodiversity. Um, I think that is starting to become part of the, the conversation that we're all having, but it's, it's only just getting traction. I'd love you to sort of expound on that a little bit and talk about the role that animals can play in regenerating land. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, because, and it really does come down to sort of management practices that make that difference. The animal does what they do, but we as farmers affect that, um, that what they're able to do. And so just a, for example, you know, if you take a continuously grazed uh, area that includes, say, a riparian area or a stream bed or something like that, those animals by nature are going to go find uh, the cool parts uh, when it's hot during the day. Their, their presence in the long term, even over the course of a day or week or month, is going to absolutely destroy that area if they are kept on that single piece. Uh, I'm big on movement. Um, it's healthy for us as humans. It's healthy for animals overall. Uh, and so you take that same scenario, that same stream bed, uh, and you put animals on that piece for 24 hours and then move them away. And now the land rests for the next uh, two weeks to two months, depending on the situation, all of a sudden the impact and the, the either in one, the first case, destruction, or in the second case, absolute benefit to the land uh, and the ecology is, is, is a massive difference. So you have concepts like rotational grazing that, that allow the land to rest and the plants to regrow. Uh, and so in so doing, you, you have a trampling effect where you have uh, carbon matter that's not potentially edible or selected pressed down into the ground and so now all of the uh, the natural processes associated with breaking down that plant matter are are encouraged you've got um, more even manuring uh, and and a biodiversity of species that that just vastly surpasses um, something where uh, where you have almost a monoculture kind of approach to things the the stream beds isn't aren't destroyed down to bare dirt and and then now susceptible for uh, water runoff to carry away that topsoil uh, but instead you've got this massive biodiverse uh, environment so lots of different plant species and now that soil is held in place um, and those plants are encouraged to grow uh, and so it, yeah it's a totally different scenario and again unfortunately cows are bad is is sort of the 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 battle cry and Again, to a certain extent, you got to be careful because that can be true. Cows done wrong can be uh, horrifically destructive. Cows done right 
can be so regenerative uh, in, uh, in, in the overall picture, in the overall ecology. Um, the difference is in how we manage them and how we mimic nature and, and encourage natural biodiversity to take place. Right, and I think that's uh, Diana Rogers' catchphrase is, it's not the cow, it's the how. Yeah, absolutely right. Well, so you, you've painted this picture of this, not just a ranch, not just a livestock operation, but sort of an ecosystem that is renewing itself and regenerating. I want to sort of transition into something you, you, you've written about for the October edition of Acres USA magazine, and it's about sort of dealing with predators. And so in the wild, you have, I picture something like buffalo, you know, roaming the plains, but then I picture apex predators sort of culling the herd and moving the herd to different places. At an operation like your own, you sort of fill that role um, as predator. You're sort of making sure they're moving. You're making, you know, you're, you're culling the herd when, when you need to. And in your latest article, you talk about sort of all the efforts that you've, you've made to sort of prevent predators from entering into your farm and, and, and wiping out your livestock. And, you know, it's a really, it's kind of a, a, a delightfully written um, piece. Um, but it, it, what's, what's kind of great about it is, it is you show the whole process sort of from beginning to end when you started, you know, trying things out and failing pretty miserably, in, at least in the beginning. And I'd love for you to sort of talk a <laughs> yeah. little bit, a little bit about the role of the predator in general, the role of the of the farmer and rancher, and then sort of how how you sort of manage that threat. Okay, yeah, that's that's absolutely right. So I, it is interesting to think about a, a farmer as a in a predator role like that. And 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 you're right, even even something as simple as moving the herd. You know, we talk about flight zones, and we talk about how to calmly. Uh, you you know when you walk out to the pasture, um, if you're if you're going to move them using those flight zones, you you approach them and get their attention, and then you circle around behind them and you you sort of uh, zigzag your way across. You're not chasing them per se, but you're you're essentially you're using that prey behavior uh, to to move the group as a whole, and so they want to stay together. They don't want to break away, uh, and so as long as you we can do that, so we kind of. We're predators with really big brains, uh, in the sense that we you can utilize behaviors, natural behaviors of prey animals to to affect the behavior that we want. Uh, and you know, same sort of thing as calling. And and certainly, I think that predation had a place, uh, a proper place in in nature. Um, and even back to the idea, like uh, like I mentioned about movement, uh, certainly uh, migratory patterns and so forth were almost were primarily about food, I would guess, but I would also imagine that predation had something to do about keeping animals on the move and, and not letting them settle into a place that, that they would if they were given the choice. Uh, so a very interesting thought process there. Um, it's, unfortunately, so we, you know, predation in that sense can be a positive thing, uh, meaning an animal is sick or, or well or old and needs to be removed. Well, that's my job. I, I make those decisions and if an animal is no longer a good fit here for, for my profitability or from a humane perspective, then I make those decisions and I remove her. Um, and so in that sense, yeah, I am acting as a predator. Unfortunately, around me, all the actual predators are also acting like predators. Right. So they're, they're not calling my, um, you know, my cows for me in a beneficial manner to me. They're eating all my baby lambs. Uh, and, you know, that's my bottom line and my, uh, my livelihood. And, and also, again, kind of my my job as a caretaker of this farm and of the, of the animals on it. So um, if only we could tell the predators, like, I got it, I got this squared away and I can take care of it. You don't, you're no longer needed here. Um, right. But they tend not to listen apparently. So what kind of, pre what kind of predators are you dealing with there? Uh, for me, in my area, Southern Ohio, um, there's for the, for the livestock, or sorry, I should say for the ruminant animals, uh, which would be calves uh, and then lambs and, and adult sheep in some forests, uh, primarily it's coyotes and, um, and stray dogs. So uh, canine predation uh, is my biggest thing. Um, on the chicken side, I, we've got raptors, uh, hawks and owls, um, and then, of course, raccoons. You know, the old joke, everybody eats chicken or everything eats chicken, mm -hmm. uh, including uh, everything out there on the farm. 
So um, keeping the chicken safe is a is a full time job in and of itself. Um, but this, I don't we don't have anything crazy like uh, you know we're not dealing with wolves or bears or anything in general. Um, other parts of the country though, that's uh, obviously that's not the case. Every every region has their own set of predators. But for me, um, the one and the the basis of the article was primarily dealing with coyote uh, and stray dog kind of uh, canine pressures. Uh, and I'm on round three or plan C. I don't know if you want to think of it that way um, as far as my predator solution. So, yeah, I've definitely uh, tried a few things. Uh, one was a complete disaster. The first one, of course. The mm -hmm. second one worked really, really well for a little while. Uh, but then all of a sudden, like a light switch got flipped um, and she was no longer effective. And so now I'm on plan C, which so far is working uh, quite well. Right. The piece for the magazine is really about your sort of adventures and misadventures in using livestock guardian animals. So tell us a little bit about how you initially approached it, sort of what mistakes were made, and then what you ultimately learned from your sort of experimentation. Yeah. So I start, I'm, in, I'm a dog guy. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a fan of dogs. I like having them around. They're um, infinitely uh, more important in my life than cats. Um, so I, for my default, when it came to livestock guardian animals, it was, it was definitely dogs was my first thought. And that's what most people, I would, I would hazard a guess, but that's mostly the case. Um, and so unfortunately for me, as is, uh, my style, especially early on, I waited until I really needed something before I finally started doing all that research to, to find out what I needed. And so all of a sudden I had sheep on the farm, um, and all of a sudden I realized, shoot, I'm not the only one that likes to eat lamb so what do I do and I so I put myself in the situation where I had to come up with an answer um, quickly which directly resulted in coming up with the wrong answer um, so I bought uh, livestock guardian dogs I got I bought two great Pyrenees because they're I mean they're just livestock guardian dogs that, so they must know what they're doing and I bought essentially to, to paraphrase I, the article I bought pets I bought animals that were um, that were parched dogs that that uh uh, that were not true guardian animals. They they were the right breed, but they were that's that's where it ended, uh, and they were a, a complete train wreck. Um, <laughs> I mean the the stories associated with those two dogs, and actually one of them's still on the farm. She's a sweet girl, and but she's a pet. I mean there's no doubt about it. Um, but I mean it was it was awful trying to to keep them into the situation that I knew I'd purchased them for. And they they were they would just weren't having any of it. The male dog was a was a runner. Uh, you know the 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 nickname for the Pyrenees, the Great Disappearnees, because uh, and he he lived up to that uh, moniker completely. He was any chance he had, he was gone. Um, worst one that I remember was Christmas Day, uh, and he got picked up six miles I think as the crow flies, um, and we got the phone call from uh, that this guy was headed the wrong way. <laughs> Funny though, because the, the female that we bought, she was right there with him the whole time. And I thought I bought, you know, I'm over two here. Um, but I, when I did finally get rid of the male, um, all of a sudden that the female Great Pyrenees, her name is Sable. She's still on the farm and she stays right close to the farm. She never wanders. She's not. So she was just a follower following the male. Um, so thankfully, I guess I got rid of the right one. Right. So you got you, you got a pet, but you didn't you got a pet, but you didn't get a guardian. I got a pet. Well, and so, I mean, sort of, because she does guard. Uh, so, you know, obviously the theory is that the, you bond the animals to the livestock. Their their livestock is their pack, and they protect that pack, right? That's the thought. But uh, she was a pet, so I'm I'm her people. Uh, so she guards me. Uh, well, she does guard me from the coyotes out in the back pasture. She just sits on my porch until they start barking and yipping, and then she takes off after them and, and chases them off the property. So, She's still somewhat effective, just not what I was looking for at the time. Right. Um, she'll be a day late and a dollar short when the animals are getting uh, attacked on the back uh, part of the property or down on the soft pastures or something like that. So she's right. definitely not effective for what I really need, but she, she still guards me. So right. she wasn't a complete failure, but not, not a, definitely not a win and not what I needed either. Um, so I, I actually bought some sheep from a, uh, from a lady in Kentucky and she recognized that she had a donkey in with her sheep. And I, I didn't even ask her about it, I don't think. 
but I did some searching online and did some research and whatnot and realized that there, there were more options than dogs and maybe I should consider um, a different type of animal. Uh, and so I did <laughs> what I do, which is go to Craigslist and go find donkeys for sale. And mm-hmm. so I bought two on Craigslist. Um, they were $200 for the pair when I uh, found them on Craigslist. I talked to the person on the phone and that the price went down to $100 a pair. And by the time I showed up there with my trailer, they were free for whoever wanted them. So uh, I got these two donkeys for free, um, which should have been a clue. But, uh, uh, you know, they they uh, they loaded up on the farm and, and, and with what I would call normal donkey uh, delays in trying to get on and off the trailer and so forth, uh, they ended up on the farm. And uh, that was a better solution, but still not a perfect one. Um, and again, I go into that in the article about why it matters and, and the difference between how animals, different guardian type of animals guard. Um, and we had one good one and one bad one. And the bad one was really bad because she, she essentially guarded the adult. She was totally fine with the adult sheep. She was in with them. She was fine with them. But when a lamb was dropped on the ground and, and, uh, and helpless, uh, she had it in her head that she needed to guard the sheep from that tiny little creature that was making a strange noise. And so she did. And she, she stomped the lambs and, and ended up becoming a predator that was inside the fence already. Um, crazy, crazy story, but she, um, yeah. she obviously found another home really quickly. And, and we ended up with one donkey who up to, up until last year has been totally amazing for me. Mm-hmm. So, but one, one good one, one bad one. So I'm, <laughs> did you have an inkling that that might be a possibility with donkeys that they might, um, no. become a problem internally? Hmm. No, I did not. I, uh, I, um, I wasn't thinking about it like I did, like I am now. Um, and even the, the genesis of the article uh, was was not on my radar at the time. I just knew that the donkeys and llamas and, and alpacas are are another type of guardian animal, so they must be fine. So let's go ahead and do that. And there were certain things about donkeys that were so much easier than than the dogs. Um, they, you know, the donkeys respect the fence better than any of the cows, sheep, dogs, no matter what. And once, once she got shocked once, like, she's good to go. She will not cross the fence. Um, you don't have to feed them kibble. Um, they can eat what the cows and sheep eat. They, you know, they subsist very, very well on, on the grass and seed heads and whatnot. So they, they do great for that. Maintenance is relatively low. You don't have to flea and tick and heart guard and, you know, do all the rabies shots and everything else. You just basically keep the flies off them as, uh, as much as possible and have somebody trim their hooves or again, my style DIY, or you go buy a set of hoof clippers and a file and figure it out. Um, mm-hmm. So maintenance wise, they were much easier than dogs. Food costs were way down or, or non-existent in my case. Uh, and so there were a lot of really good things about the animals, but the, the difference in how they guard and the potential liability, if for some reason in this, animal's brain something was substantially different about a lamb than about a sheep and as a result she essentially became a predator um, in that scenario which was awful to to finally figure out and watch and realize like oh i i did that um but on the other hand if you have an animal that doesn't recognize that it worked out really well for for multiple years uh with with the second donkey and she was very effective so and what's your current situation and setup with livestock guardian animals? So I, donkey was, uh, that's her name, by the way, donkey, um, right. uh, was, was really effective up until last year. And then all of a sudden I just got annihilated one summer or last summer, I should say 2018. And it just didn't make any sense to me. I couldn't figure out what was happening. So, uh, come to, as I began to think about it, uh, you know, my, my, farm and my operation has grown every year. It's been amazing to, to have the herd and the, and the flock together uh, uh, grow in size and paddocks are getting better. And, you know, I'm still able to contain all of the animals and, and feed them properly on my land. So again, kind of back to that ecological sustainable concept, the, the animal impact has increased my uh, potential for, for holding animals on the same piece of property. Uh, that's absolutely been true. But uh, in so doing, my paddock sizes are bigger uh, in general. They're, they're, I have more animals to cover. And as, uh, as I got bigger and bigger, 
uh, it makes sense that Donkey would become less and less effective because of the way she guards. She essentially has to be sort of forced into contact with the predator. She's not going to go chase or respond to uh, uh, a, a help cry uh, or, you know, she doesn't care about the sheep. She just hates dogs. Uh, and so she she guards totally differently than the dogs who guard out of this affinity for their animal uh, that they're that they're paired with and, and bonded to. So the dogs will respond to a help cry even from acres away, uh, no pun intended. But the donkey she she could conceivably be in one corner of the paddock and the an attack happen in the other corner, and she could care less. Uh, and so that I think is what happened uh, where I just got big enough and my paddock sizes got big enough to where she was no longer forced into contact with the predator uh, or, and probably the predators got smart and began to recognize that whenever she was around, she got, they got chased away. So now they'll wait for her to wander off and there's enough space for that to happen and, and before they attack. And so now uh, I'm back to dogs, dogs done right, uh, or at least I'm better. Uh, again, I'm still very much uh, learning uh, how to do that, but I have, uh, an adult dog on the property who uh, is is uh, currently guarding, and I have had zero uh, predation losses this this summer so far. Uh, and I also have a puppy that I'm in the process of bonding to sheep right now. Um, he was born on the farm, and then he's he's going to uh, join his daddy uh, as a livestock guardian dog. So I'll have the pair, um, I hope, correctly bonded and and respecting my fence and effectively guarding a much larger space than, than the donkey was going to be able to. So I'm back to dogs, but dogs done better. What takeaways do you have from going through this whole process of elimination and really experimenting with your approach? What would you tell other people who are raising livestock? What's the wisdom you've really been able to glean from this whole process? Um, so I think my, my first inc- uh, the and I'm, I'm guilty of this, and it, maybe it's part personality, but maybe it's just part you know, you have to be kind of headstrong and belligerent to be successful in farming anyway. But for me, I got myself in trouble the first time and, and really created a, this is sort of chaotic environment uh, where, in, and even in that environment, I found myself sort of struggling to, to think things through logically and find out facts from fiction and, and, and see through the fog, if you will. Uh, and I did that all to myself by moving too fast and getting – getting uh, livestock, specifically sheep, when I wasn't ready, I didn't have the whole picture in mind. I knew I wanted sheep. Uh, actually, I promised myself I'd never be a shepherd until I started selling lamb. And all of a sudden, I mean, lamb flew off the shelves so quickly. I was like, well, okay, I guess I better do this. And so I was driven by by that sort of desire to fill the need and and the financial aspects of it. And I got myself in a situation where operationally, I wasn't ready to properly support that. Uh, and so I would, the first thing I would say would be to sort of recognize the potential for that sort of a situation. Uh, and you can apply that to, you know, any enterprise, vegetable, fruit, animal, livestock, uh, that, that lesson, uh, you know, avoiding the temptation to jump into something so quickly that you haven't thought it fully through. Um, and you put yourself in a position now where, um, where you, you're just spending a lot of time fighting something that you really didn't need to at all, all along uh, if you only took a little bit longer to, to put something into action. Uh, that'd be the first thing. Uh, and then the second, I, I, I guess, would be to sort of, as much as possible, fully understand that an, animal behavior is huge. When we talk about livestock, we, you know, you, both in terms of the, the animals that are under your care, the animals that are outside of your care, and the ones that are, you know, there to to do a job for you, fully understanding uh, both the benefits and the liabilities, uh, the, the workarounds that are required for for whatever you um, whatever you're attempting to to start on the farm. Uh, I don't think I had a full grasp of of the implications of bringing a couple of dogs onto the property. I was like, well, you know, they're they're livestock guardian dogs. They're the right breed, so I might. I'll just throw them in with a sheep and they'll figure it out. It's going to be great. And that's not what happened. Uh, and obviously, in hindsight now, tell me the story, I, I feel dumb even thinking that that's the case. But I thought that for real. I thought it uh, legitimately. And I, so the trap is that you, 
ignore reality and ignore logic a little bit when you've got uh, some dollar signs and some opportunity in front of you. And uh, just tell folks to, you know, listen to that little warning sign in the back of your head that says, you know, hold on a minute, let me think this through or go ask somebody who knows what they're talking about and figure, uh, uh, figure out what the uh, barriers and potential destruction and, and uh, disaster lay in front of me with this new idea before I jump into it. Okay, so you, you've developed this knack for keeping predators away from your livestock. What other challenges are you facing currently at your operation right now? And how are you dealing with them? Um, the, the, the biggest thing that I'm finding now uh, is the, the size of my operation is continuing to grow. The demand is, is 100% still there uh, and, and growing as well as, as folks figure out this, this food movement thing. Uh, I'm finding myself in a position uh, manpower wise or uh, that I'm, I'm getting close to the limit of what I can do by myself. Uh, and so I, the, my first challenge is, is, a, is a manpower um, type of, of, of thing where I, I – and I want to combine that with my desire to speak into other people as well. So um, I'm becoming limited in what I can do or, or more specifically what I can do well. Uh, and, and so I'm really thinking through and trying to plan for the potential of potential, uh, a, an internship program or an apprenticeship type of program, something where I can – uh, not only get the value of, of someone else working the farm with me, but also express and put into play my, my values of speaking into other folks and getting them um, the, the, the education, the knowledge, and the encouragement that they need to potentially do this on their own someday. So uh, I think an intern and apprenticeship type of program for, for my farm is a logical next step, uh, and that's something that's on my radar um, uh, in, the, in the very near future. Um, the, the weather is continuing to be everybody's problem, whether you're a grain farmer in Ohio or a livestock farmer, you know, it doesn't matter. It's just, things are getting a little crazy, uh, as it mm -hmm. pertains to weather and climate. Uh, and so, um, just, just in June, uh, we had the, the, the craziest flash flood, I think is what it was. We had a regular old thunderstorm come up and it started to rain and then it started to rain some more and then it was really heavy rain. And I just looking out the window, realized like there's water running where I've never seen water running. And granted, I haven't been here forever, but I, I mean, I, I pay attention to the rain. Obviously, I raise grass for a living, so rain is really important to me. Uh, and I began to see water coming and, and flowing where there normally wasn't. So I went out and took a look, and it was the scariest thing I've seen in a long time, this sort of massive amount of water rushing down through what normally was just a wet weather creek and it it was crazy uh and that was just june of this past year, of, of this year and uh it completely destroyed all three culverts uh, along um, my driveway and on the property um, it receded just as quickly as it came but after the damage was done uh, uh my kids and i were isolated on the farm for uh, a day oh, almost two days Nobody could get in. Nobody, I mean, we were fine in the house, but uh, and <laughs> I raised meat for a living, so I, we were we were good for eating. But uh, but yeah, I was just thinking to myself, well, shoot, I hope I don't slip and fall and you know break something, or my kids have an accident or anything crazy right now because nobody can get to me. Um, and it was a it was a, a real sobering moment. Uh, and and I talked to other folks in the area, uh, and they they said they've never seen anything like that in their time here. Um, and so these sort of significant weather events are a real challenge. Um, as far as solutions to that, I, I am I'm moving, uh, you know, my biggest thing, of course, as far as crops go is just hay uh, for, for winter feeding and so forth. And so I'm moving away from a traditional four-day sunny window in the summer to make hay. Uh, I'm starting, uh, I've purchased a bale wrapper uh, to where I can do fermented forage and do haylage, um, where now I can cut one afternoon and bale the next day, wrap it in in um, uh, plastic and now that entire bale ferments and is incredibly nutritious forage uh, and my weather window is is reduced from four days down to two um, and so it, just trying to take some steps some smart steps that way to address the 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 continuing weather challenges um, that that are facing agriculture uh, all over the country uh, those are the top two that come to my mind do you feel like you were perhaps at an advantage given the way that you manage your land 
um, in, in that particular weather event. Um, I, I've heard anecdotes and stories um, about how, you know, ranchers who really focus on soil health and biodiversity tend to weather those storms a little better than those who don't. And I wonder if that was your experience. Yeah, the, the only thing I struggle with that thought process, I agree with the theory, um, but I, what I can't do is I can't prove it. It's one of those things, <laughs> and so much of starving is this way, where, you know, even when there's problems, I mean, so my, my culverts washed out, that's a bad thing, right? So I had enough water on the farm and enough water uh, didn't get absorbed into the ground, wasn't slowed by the fact that I have perennial pasture instead of bare ground. Uh, you know, all the things that I would talk to and point to as positives didn't, in this case, solve the problem. The, the, the real question, though, and the recognition is that you can't take that as a singular instance because in the back of your head, you always got to wonder, well, what if it was different? What if this was a continuously grazed pasture where the grass wasn't seven to ten inches tall? It's, it was uh, a quarter inch to, to an inch tall, and the water was even, you know, mo moved across that ground even faster and was even less impeded and it would be, you know, how much worse would, could it have been? So uh, I struggle a little bit only because I don't really have a whole lot of apples to apples comparisons. Um, I would say that I, most of the time, the things that challenge other people um, in the area uh, are less of a problem for me. So I would say yes in that sense. Um, but in the end, I still had, you know, heavy flooding um, as a result of a, of a rainstorm on a, on a what I would call an ecologically managed, you know, pasture-based operation. Um, the real question is that I don't have an answer for, and so I, I can't really prove it, is how much worse could it have been if, I, if my pastures or my, my ground was bare and my, um, you know, my, my land less able to absorb moisture. Um, so I have to imagine that those things helped, but I can't prove it. What are you hearing from long-time long -time farmers in the area or um, in terms of weather? Are they giving you insight into how anomalous events like this are? Are they seeing sort of changes and events that they haven't seen for generations? What, what are you hearing when you're having coffee with some of the people who've really been working the land there in your area for generations? Yeah, it's really interesting to have those conversations because there's, there's two groups uh, in, 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 that, in that scenario that you described. Uh, and one group is getting smaller and smaller, and one is growing and growing. And so you, the first group you have are the ones who are are keen to just uh, dismiss whatever you want to call it. So, um, you know, uh, global warming was a terrible label for, for the problem that we're having because you know, just people it gave people an easy opportunity to say, well, there's not actually getting warmer, or it's not here, and, or this was the coldest winter on uh, – you know, on record. So how, you know, those kinds of things that people say, but regardless, I mean, I suppose they'd probably be dismissive regardless of what we called it, but that group that's just immediately like, well, I mean, that, that wet weather Creek that you had flooded back in 33, you know, that kind of thing, like, okay, fine. But so there's, there's a group that is getting smaller and smaller who are, essentially willing to look past all of the evidence, all of the anecdotal and the scientific and all of the warnings that are, that are, that are building. And just, they are the true ostrich head in the sand. Uh, everything's fine. And I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing no matter what. Uh, thankfully that group is getting smaller and smaller. And I think people are uh, in agriculture, uh, especially conventional farmers are, and rightfully so are very tender to the idea, to being the scapegoat uh, and or the, the key problem. Uh, they recognize that there is a problem, um, but a lot of times, you, right or wrong, um, conventional agriculture is, the, is the, the one who's to blame and getting fingers pointed. And so obviously that's gonna turn those folks off and close their mind and their ears to hearing about potential solutions. Um, but I think overall, um, agriculture is recognizing the reality of variable weather, um, uh, more extremes on both ends, and this concept of, of, of changing weather and climatic conditions and how it's affecting us as a whole. Uh, and people are more willing to hear that. Um, folks just, in my opinion, really have to be careful about the, the, the message they're carrying. 
because too often we're pointing fingers instead of um, uh, talking about potential solutions that everybody in agriculture can can offer to the problem. Um, but it is at least a step in the right direction that more and more people are willing to talk about that and recognize that there is something happening here, whether it's a, I don't think it really even matters. I mean, if this is a cycle that happens every 300 years or every 3,000 years, who cares? The fact of the matter is that it's affecting us today, next year, five years, and it's going to affect us and our families uh, in our the next generation we hope is going to take over the farm. That's true regardless of what you, you know, whether this is a normal cycle and it's all going to go back to normal or, you know, or what we call normal or not. It doesn't really matter. The here and now is absolutely changing uh, and, and becoming more drastic in, in, in its streams. And so I think folks are more than ever ready to hear that message. So, Paul, you're speaking at the Acres USA Eco Ag Conference in December in Minneapolis. And yeah, for, for listeners sure who don't. Excited. Yeah, and for listeners who don't know what that is, it's sort of like Woodstock for uh, ranchers and farmers. Um, and uh, <laughs> so in addition to playing a dissonant uh, guitar version of Star Spangled Banner, what can, um, what can our listeners expect from you at that conference? Well, it's, uh, it's Minneapolis in December, so I bring a coat uh, for sure. But other than that, I mean, the, the Acres family is, is, is amazing. And so when folks get together in, in a, a warm structure, uh, like a conference uh, hall, it's amazing the conversations and the unity and the uh, the ideas that come out of uh, this this group of folks that get together once a year. And so it's a I, I loved it last year. I was so blessed to to be a part of that and to to equal parts uh, be able to speak into others, but also um, soak up uh, folks that are you know the next step uh, or two or ten ahead of me uh, in this process. And so it's a really interesting mix of truly committed food folks and agriculture folks, uh, sustainable and ecological food and farming is for once, first and foremost on the agenda. Uh, but it's, it really is a super cool environment for folks to, uh, to come and soak in and uh, take away the sort of excitement uh, moving into the, you know, 2020 spring uh, for, for their farm, for their operation, for whatever they've got in front of them. Um, Acres is an amazing family to be a part of, and the conference is, is uh, puts that, in my opinion, puts that first and foremost and puts that totally up front um, for folks to, to truly enjoy and partake in. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. And what are you going to focus on in your talk? Well, um, I've got a couple different options. Uh, yeah, I do a, a rotational grazing kind of 101, very basic concepts uh, uh, talk. I, I talk a lot about multi-species synergy. That's something that uh, that somebody like me and my farm uh, has that's uh, that's different than other folks and, and there's a lot of really cool synergistic aspects of different types of livestock and the, uh, yeah, treating the farm as a as a as a piece of the whole environment that it's in as opposed to our you know four fences across our boundaries being where where our farm supposedly ends um, so there's um, uh, I do a synergistic kind of concept of uh, but it I mean, the topics across the whole conference are, are wide ranging and, and there's something there for everybody. Uh, I might be talking about uh, livestock guardians. I don't know yet. Um, that's possible as well. I would love to do that. So um, uh, I'm not sure what my specific role will be, but regardless, I'm excited about it. And um, uh, I would encourage folks to, to seriously consider making the trek into the Arctic. I mean, into the, uh, <laughs> into the North uh, in December. To, uh, to attend because it, it's, uh, it's a really special place and a special time uh, and the, the knowledge and the folks that are there, uh, myself not included in that, are, um, it's, a, it's an amazing group of folks and, and Acres does an amazing job putting together a truly quality conference with, full of information for everybody. Where can people find you online, Paul? I have a website, uh, which is pasturedprovidence.com. That's P-A-S-T-U-R-E-D. Providence is P-R-O-V-I-D-E-N-C-E dot com. Uh, I'm also on Facebook. If you find pasturedprovidence.com, I don't have any other social media, much to my chagrin. Um, uh, but uh, those would be the two places to start. And if you wanted to continue a conversation via phone, email, or otherwise, my contact information is available online. Great. Thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. 
There you have it. Thanks again to Paul Dorans. Go check out his piece in the October issue of Acres USA. Go to AcresUSA.com to subscribe to the magazine. Factor Time is brought to you by Acres USA Magazine and sponsored by BCS America. You can find this podcast at ecofarmingdaily.com, acresusa.com, or anywhere podcasts can be played. Thanks, and have a great week.